Welcome back nerds. Today I'll be teaching you the difference between value and reference types, as well as a deep dive in how these variables and data are stored in memory, which in turn will allow you to write more performant code. And it will also just be nice for you to know what's actually happening behind the scenes when you're creating these variables. So the flow of this video will be, I'll show you a surface look of value types and reference types and how they work. I'll then give you a deep dive on the memory allocations of them. And then once you understand that part, we can pop back out and then we'll go kind of deeper on uh, different use cases and a few gotchas of using value and reference types. All right, so let's start with value types. We've got a whole bunch of value types available to us. For example, the entire numeric range of value types. Uh, we've got booleans, we've got structs. I'm going to be using structs going forward as they'll offer the most excitement to us. And I've actually prepared one earlier, so you don't have to watch me write it out. It's just a coordinate struct. It's got an X and a Y, and I've also overrided the string. So whenever we print it, it will print out the actual value nice and pretty for us. So let's create a new variable here called A, and let's make it equal to new coords. And let's just uh, add this one and two. And then we'll make another variable here and we'll just assign it directly to A. So now when we print these two, let's just print A and then we'll print B and run it. We'll see that it prints one, two, one, two, as I'm sure everybody guessed. But now what happens if we take B and we now set X to something like 66? What happens if we run that? It now prints A as one, two, and then B as 66 and two. So even though that we assigned B to A and then we changed B X, it did not change A. And that is because structs are value types and they hold their own data. So what happened here when we assigned B to A is we just copied the data to a new location. So now A and B are just two completely separate pieces of data. And that is fundamentally how value types work. So if we were to simply change this now, to a class, what do you think this is gonna print? Let's run it. Aha, uh -huh, they're both 66 too. So what happened here? Well, we first created a new instance of our coordinates class, which is a reference type, remember? Next, we created a new variable called B and assigned it to A. So if this was a value type, it would have just copied the data as you just learned. But as a reference type, all we're doing is creating a brand new pointer to this data, which is stored somewhere, right? So we now have this coordinates data somewhere in memory, and now we have A and B, which are just references pointing to this data. And because of that, now that we come down to this line, B.X equals 66, because these are both pointing to the same data, obviously it doesn't matter what we do here, whether it's A or B, this will achieve the exact same result. Before we get too deep into these two different types, let's talk about how and where data is actually stored. Uh, in C-sharp, data is stored in two places, the stack and the heap. So let's start with the stack. The stack is for static data, or in other terms, data that we unequivocally know the size of at compile time. So for example, we know that an integer requires 32 bits. We know that a double requires 64 bits. And because we know the size of this data, we can easily and neatly store this, these memory allocations in the stack. Let's run through an example so that you better understand how this works. All right, let's go through this line by line. And I just know that future Matt is going to hate me because there's gonna be so much editing on the screen and it's gonna take uh, future Matt a freaking long time, but oh well, better him than me. So line one, uh, we've got an integer here called one with an assignment of 12. So that is going to hold three pieces of information, the variable name, what type it is, so integer in this case, and the actual data. So uh, this data will be 32 bits in size and it will hold. 12. Once that's done, what is called this stack pointer is going to move up by 32 bits, ready for the next allocation of memory, which is lucky because on this next line, we're doing the same thing. We're allocating a new integer onto the stack. This one will be called two. And once again, our pointer will move up 32 bits, ready for the next allocation. Uh, and then we come down to this useless function. So we jump into this function here and we allocate a new int. This time will be called three and it will have a value of 56. And now this is where it gets interesting. So this function is about to end, right? This is about to go out of scope, uh, which means it needs to be deallocated. So as soon as it hits this end bracket here, it now informs the stack, hey, we don't need this anymore. Uh, this is out of scope, get rid of it. And now this is what makes the stack so fast. So uh, the stack doesn't actually delete this data. 
Uh, all it does is it moves the stack pointer back down to the point it was when it entered this scope. So it knows that it only allocated 32 bits of memory in this scope, so it just goes down by 32 bits, right? Uh, so that data is actually still there, but once we get down to here now, the four, this is simply just going to override that last piece of data. So as you can see, uh, knowing the size of the data beforehand at compile time allows us to use this incredibly fast allocation and deallocation of uh, data on the stack. Now, a good little mental exercise to really cement this in your brain is uh, think of this recursive function, which I'm sure Future Matters put on the screen. Try to imagine how the stack allocations are going to look uh, traversing through uh, this recursive function. And then once it actually reaches the value that it needs, actually deallocating uh, all these all this memory. But in short, the stack was created for super fast allocation and deallocation, uh, but it only works with fixed data size. For dynamic data, aka reference types, we need to store them elsewhere, which is the heap. So the heap allows the data contained within it to grow and shrink at runtime. So that makes it perfect to store things like collections and classes and delegates, uh, which we have no idea at compile time how big those things are actually gonna be, right? So let's see how that works. Let's create a new hero here called hero A, make it equal to a new hero. So in the same way as our value type, this will allocate a new piece of stack data uh, and it will hold the variable name, the type, which is a hero, but instead of holding the data right on the stack, it's going to have a pointer or a reference to a piece of data that is being held on the heap. So that is the distinctive difference between the two. Values hold the actual data themselves, whereas reference types hold just a reference to the data which is held on the heap. So now let's run through that same exercise that we did for the value types, but this time we'll do it for the reference types just to see the delta. So line one, we're creating a new instance of the hero class, right? So that is making a stack allocation with the name, the type, which is hero. Uh, but this time it's not actually holding the data of the hero. It is just a reference or a pointer to the allocation on the heap. Next, we create a new variable called B and we assign it to A. So now what happens is we create a new stack allocation for this variable, which holds hero B, the name, the type, hero, but now this one points to the same allocation on the heap as hero A. So we now have two variables here pointing to the same piece of data. Next, we go into our useless function here and we create a new instance of hero and we call this hero C. And now we have reached the end of our function. So this is going out of scope and needs to be cleaned up. So the stack now simply moves its stack pointer uh, back down however big this class was. So we've only got one integer in here. So it's gonna be 32 bits. So it moves down by 32 bits. Now as easy and as quick as that was for the stack to deallocate, it's a little bit more tricky for the heap. So the heap now has this piece of data and it's got no stack pointers pointing to it. So it is marked for garbage collection. So this does not happen instantly, but at some point in the future, the garbage collector will come along, it will see that it's been marked for uh, deallocation and it will clean it up. We leave the function now, we come down here, we allocate another hero to the stack and also the heap. Uh, and then that's basically the end of our function. So once, once this exits, the uh, stack will deallocate and then the garbage collector will eventually come and pick up our three pieces of hero data. Or is it two? Three. So with all this said, it still is not really clear when to use a struct and when to use a class, right? It may seem logical to just always wanna use a struct because allocations and read to the stack is super fast, right? So why would we not want to take advantage of that? Uh, but take this scenario for example. So I've got a recursive function here and it takes in this value holder and all this value holder is is just a struct with a double on it. We first add one to the value. If it's equal or over 1000, we'll return it. And this is a recursive function. So it's obviously going to cascade down before it returns. And if it's not over a thousand, we'll recursively call our, ourself uh, and then it will add the one and then check for a thousand again and then eventually it will return. So in this scenario, we will be allocating 1000 pieces of memory to the stack and each of those allocations need to be big enough to store a double. 
right? So 64 bits, each one of those allocations will be 64 bits. Now, conversely, if this was a class, yes, we still have to put 1000 allocations on the stack because they all need to uh, tell us where this pointer is. But the heap is the only thing that needs to allocate enough room for this object, right? So the, the heap has a 64 bit allocation, all 1000 of those stack uh, allocations are pointing to the heap. Now, one thing to note before we dive into a decision here is that on a struct, on a value type, we still need a little bit of data to store that pointer. That pointer on a 32-bit system is going to be four bytes, so 32 bits. On a 64-bit system, it's gonna be eight bytes, so 64 bits, uh, which is uh, actually the same size as a double, right? So we are, it would actually be better here to use a struct still than the class uh, because at least with the struct, we're saving that one uh, garbage allocation, right? On the heap, that it's one little allocation, but in this case, it's better to use a struct. So what now if this uh, value holder doesn't just have one value, it's got two doubles on it now. So it's not just 64 bits of uh, allocation that needs to go on the stack, it's now 128. So now these thousand stack allocations is doing 128 per allocation. Whereas if it was a class, we're just doing uh, 1000 pointers down to the 128 bit on the heap. So in this scenario, it now outweighs the benefit of the struct and we should use a class. So the more data you have, the better it is to use the class. Another thing to note is that the stack actually has roughly one megabyte limit. If you have, and I'm sure you have, ever accidentally written an infinite loop, uh, you've probably been hit with the stack overflow exception. So now you know exactly what that is, right? It just kept allocating to the stack until it reached a point where it, it ran out of memory and had to, uh, had to exit. It's also worth mentioning that when you're writing multi-threaded applications, uh, every single thread has its own stack allocation. It's, each, each thread has one megabyte of stack allocation um, that can't be shared across the threads, whereas they can actually all access the same heap memory. So uh, I won't get into that now, but good thing to know anyway. Uh, we're almost done. I did mention that uh, value types don't always go on the stack. So if you create a list of integers, for example, list is a reference type, which means it's gonna go on the heap and all of its contents will also be on the heap. The only thing that's gonna go on the stack there is the uh, pointer to the actual list, which holds all the integers on there. So that's one way that value types get stored on the, on the heap. The next way is if you have a class here and then say you've got these uh, value types at the top level of the um, class, uh, because this is going on the heap, these will also go on the heap. So even though they're value types, they're still going on the heap. The last way that I know that uh, value types can go on the heap is say you've got an integer, my number equals uh, 69. If we now later come down here and we box it, so my obj equals my number, right? So we're now converting this from a value type to a reference type. This is now on the heap. And one final thing before I go uh, is I wanted to just quickly talk about strings. Now strings are pretty funky. So strings are actually a reference type because uh, we want them to dynamically be sized, right? We don't want to create a string, my string equals H, right? We don't want this to uh, be the same memory allocation as like the maximum string size, right? Uh, so it's good that strings can be dynamically sized, but we would not like strings to act as reference types, right? So if we uh, made another string, my string two, oh my God, whatever, equals my string. Uh, and then we did something like this, my string two uh, plus equals more stuff. That would be uh, ludicrous, right? If uh, my string also was affected by this. Uh, we definitely want our strings to be acting like value types. So they they really are a bit of an anomaly, uh, whereas they're kind of like in between reference and, um, and value types. And it's also worth mentioning that strings are immutable. So me concatenating this string on top of my string two did not actually uh, change my string two. It now discarded my string two and has created a brand new string. And because these are reference types, these are all being allocated to the heap, which have to be cleaned up by the garbage collector. So remember that, uh, that's, that's why 
string builders are good because they they don't do all these allocations until the very end uh, but i'm not going to get into that because i'm going to actually do a video on string builder because it's very interesting and holy moly my voice is uh dying because i've been talking for so freaking long i hope you enjoyed it i hope you learned a whole load um uh, like the video subscribe and i will be back shortly with another one ciao